Um, what I will try to do is to give you sort of an overview of the uh, nuclear program worldwide uh, from its origins to the, to the pre-Fukushima situation and then a few uh, ideas on a number of countries um, uh, on the impact that uh, f the Fukushima events have had on, on nuclear planning. So, first of all, if you look at uh, nuclear reactor startups and shutdowns. You see that from the origin uh, in, in the 50s to today, we basically had two large construction waves. In green, you see the grid connections of new reactors starting up, and in red, you see the, the shutdowns uh, reactors that are being taken off the grid. So we had a wave in the 19, big wave in the 1970s and a big wave in the 1980s. And as of the end of the 1980s, the color red is pretty much uh, taken um, over the uh, overall situation. Now, in, in, for 2011, just to clarify what is in there, I, I have count, we have counted 19 reactors shut down. Those are 10 reactors at Fukushima 1 and 2 like a Daiichi and Daini, um, and uh, there are eight German reactors and one UK reactor. Those, those are the 19 reactors. There's five reactors that started up in the world uh, this year, uh, a couple of Chinese reactors, um, an Iraq, uh, a reactor in Iran that has been under construction, had been under construction since 1975. So it was about time that it would start up at some point. Um, there's a reactor in India and one in, in Pakistan. By the way, the Pakistani reactor started up on the 14th of March, 2011. It didn't really attract a lot of attention when this reactor was started up. In fact, uh, the Pakistani government didn't even did any kind of release uh, around that uh, event, which is very unusual. Uh, normally, when a reactor starts up, it's kind of a, a very big, major thing. This was not reported in Pakistani newspapers three days after the Fukushima crisis started. Now, <clears throat> what is the cumulative uh, situation of units uh, worldwide um, uh, in operation? Uh, it's very easy. You can see that there was a, an uninterrupted um, build-up of the nuclear program until the end of the 1980s. By 1989, it reached the first um, uh, culminating point. Uh, and since then, it is basically flat. Today, the number of reactors operating, uh, operating is also discussable. Uh, as you will see, uh, reactors that are in the listing as operational doesn't mean that they necessarily deliver kilowatt hours um, uh, on a daily basis. But 427 reactors are operating to be compared with 424 uh, in 1989. I mean, that's exactly the same level. This is no, no significant change whatsoever. The historical maximum was uh, reached in 2002 with 444 units. Now, the orange line you have here is the installed electricity generating capacity. And you can see that the shape of the curve is not exactly identical. I'm very interested in shapes of curves rather than absolute figures, uh, because this is basically a trend analysis. So what we want to try to understand what goes up, what goes down, what is large, what is small, rather than the absolute figures, which are all debatable to in, one, in one way or another, and they, they, they change. Um, <clears throat> so this uh, curve, the installed capacity is different mainly for two reasons. One is reactors that were started up in most of the cases were larger than the ones that were shut down. So you get with the same uh, uh, number of reactors a larger installed capacity. And the second reason is that um, many reactors have go undergone what is called uprating, which means you increase the capacity uh, in uh, existing reactors by technical means, sometimes uh, to a very large extent uh, that can reach over 20% of the installed power. 
it's kind of interesting that this never attracted any major attention in terms of uh, public or societal debate. Um, so we had installed capacity, installed number of reactors. This is the uh, electricity uh, generation worldwide by nuclear power plants in 2010. Um, the first thing which is remarkable is there's about 30 countries generating nuclear uh, electricity. In fact, 2011 is one more because of Iran that started up a nuclear reactor. Uh, but it's not sort of a, a, a distributed uh, um, a phenomenon. Uh, the six largest countries, US, France, Japan, Russia, South Korea, and Germany, um, uh, generate between two-thirds and three-quarters of the nuclear electricity in the world. So it's very much concentrated to a small number of, of countries. Uh, and obviously you can expect that Japan and Germany will play a much lower, smaller role uh, starting uh, 2011. The other um, uh, order of magnitude is this corresponds to roughly 13% of the electricity generated worldwide. And 13% of electricity is, is about 5.5% of commercial primary energy. Uh, now, commercial primary energy um, is the energy that is actually being uh, uh, injected uh, in, in the first place. But in the transformation process, you lose a lot of energy in, in terms of every power plant, in terms of uh, thermal uh, waste heat into the environment. So the, what is called the final energy that is actually covered by uh, nuclear power is only roughly 2%. So this is what we're talking about, a phenomenon that covers 2% of final energy consumption. Um, this very quickly is the age structure of uh, the, the operating uh, nuclear reactors in the world. As you can see, the average age is now standing at somewhere around 26 years. That is a quite advanced age as an average age. And you can see that the first um, uh, construction phase, obviously this is like the reverse graph of the building, logically, right, of the building uh, um, uh, scale. So this, this the, uh, construction wave from the 70s reaches 40 years. More and more reactors will uh, reach 40 years if they are not uh, shut down. So it becomes a, age is becoming a very major issue. Uh, now, what about new projects? The term renaissance has been used, uh, revival, whatever, of uh, nuclear power over the last 10 years. By the way, a term that has been very much introduced by the nuclear industry itself. So it's not so much uh, people that, that have uh, invented that term describing what happens. It's rather the wishful thinking of the nuclear industry that has uh, run a very major uh, a promotion campaign since 2000-2001. Uh, those are uh, reactor construction projects um, that, as you can see, we indeed we have sort of a, a, a surge of reactors under construction. What is less clear to people is that in 2005 it, it reached an, a very, very low level, like the lowest level of numbers of units under construction since the 1950s. And we are very far from the historical peaks of the maximum that was reached is 233 units uh, under construction at the same time. Now who is building? I don't want to go into details, just to say there's only four countries that have more than two reactors under construction at the same time. It's China, India, uh, Russia, and uh, uh, South Korea. Uh, uh, the, the other thing that is remarkable is that uh, the construction, if you look at the construction starts, uh, there, there are units that have been in this listing for a very long time. So if you see dates like 1985, 1987, 85, 86, 87, 81. The record holder is a US plant that has been in the statistics since 1972. 
Uh, it's supposed to start up in 2012. That's 40 years project life. Um, I would love Steve having a look at the financing costs of that project. That would be probably an interesting uh, exercise for an, for an economist. But I, I have a hard time imagining that this plan will ever run into a positive uh, balance sheet. Uh, now, there is what is called technology learning curves, which is a very simple idea. It has been mentioned in the introductory uh, uh, remarks of the, uh, both speakers. Uh, photovoltaics, for example, have gone down very significantly over the past few years. Even by months, you can me measure the, 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 the cost installed kilowatt costs uh, for renewable energies. Those are cost curves. Uh, for over time since 1980 for, for various technologies and it's always the same kind of uh, shape more or less steep decline in, in, in costs. If you look now at the nuclear learning curves you can call it a negative learning curve. Um, this is an analysis into all of the operating uh, US reactors uh, U.S. reactors also because the, the available cost data is much better than to, for many other uh, countries. Uh, and you can see a clear average uh, increase in, um, in, in cost. So it's a, a reverse phenomenon that you have actually for other technologies. If you look at the same thing, that's a study that has been done on the French program. So if you think the French program is doing any better, it does not. Nuclear power plants have become more and more expensive uh, over time. Uh, in fact, uh, that is the last reactor that has been put into operation. This is in, in French francs per installed kilowatt. If you did put uh, the current uh, plant under construction at Flamanville into this scale, it would be 25,000, about 25,000 equivalent French francs per installed kilowatt. That's the current cost estimate uh, at 6 billion euros. So it would be somewhere on the ceiling here, right? It would be way off scale. But the logic has, has increased, uh, the logic has, has uh, continued the same way uh, with time more and more uh, expensive nuclear power plants. Another project under construction by the French nuclear industry um, uh, at Okilokto. Uh, th there you have the same kind of negative learning curve uh, in, in one, for one project. Like it was originally planned to cost something like two and a half uh, billion euros and is now standing at uh, six billion euros. Um, Without going into details, it's basically the key problems is that they can't build these plans to budget and in time. Uh, we're talking a finished pro uh, project for a total of something like 15, 16 years if it did go into operation. Uh, yesterday, incidentally, was announced the latest new delay of the project. Uh, pushing it from 2000, late 2013 into 2014 as a, as a new start update. Uh, so we're talking 15, 16 years. It has gone up, basically doubled in, in uh, over double in cost estimates. Um, interesting is that uh, um, the builder, Arriva, that had the curious idea to give a fixed price uh, to the client, uh, which means that it has basically to bear the, the additional cost uh, is obviously running into quite uh, significant problems with this project. Uh, and MP that is doing a report in France on the issue has announced a few days ago that more additional provisions for losses of Arriva are likely. Now in this, in, in, in this kind of atmosphere pre-Fukushima of uh, utilities talking about nuclear project, uh, credit rating agencies started having a closer look uh, to uh, utilities that have built nuclear power plants and invested in this area in the past. 
And they did an analysis of 48 um, US utilities. The result is pretty stunning. Of those 48 utilities, uh, 40 had a negative <coughs> impact on credit rating. Um, six utilities uh, remained identical in credit rating and two had a positive effect. So that's a very uh, negative overall uh, picture. Uh, credit rating is very important and if I was working at chess uh, I would wonder what impact nuclear projects in the future will have on credit rating. Chess was downgraded by Standard & Poor's in November uh, last year um, uh, and the standalone note is, is not that brilliant anymore with BBB plus and it's, it's not impossible that you know any other major investment project would have a devastating effect on the credit rating. Now why is credit rating important? Because it basically determines how expensive money will be for a company. So what is the, the, what is the interest rate that, that a company uh, or, or a country as we've seen with, other, with a number of countries now will get on the, on the public credit markets. Now just in, in order to give you a few comparisons with other uh, technologies, in terms of uh, uh, net additions, annual additions to the world electricity grid, here's a comparison between wind in blue, uh, solar in, in green, and uh, uh, nuclear power in red. Uh, and you can see that it's, it's, it's actually been a long time that in terms of net additions uh, to the grid, uh, renewable energy technologies have taken over um, and uh, nuclear power is actually on a, uh, on a rather, you know, in the longer term on, an, on a decline basis. Uh, Amory Levins, who, who uh, is the founder and, and sci scientific director of Rocky Mountain Institute, famous analyst, uh, he runs his own uh, database and, and has compared uh, historically over the past 10 years uh, nuclear power um, uh, share of global electricity generation uh, uh, between micropower, which where he adds to renewables um, uh, cogeneration plants, uh, and he takes off big hydro because he doesn't consider, as many people don't consider, uh, big hydro dams as renewable energy. And you can see that it's already in been in, in 2000, around 2005 that the crossover has taken place. Um, if you look in the uh, European Union and you look at over the 10 year period as accumulated effect, so what was added and was, was sub subtracted from the European Union grid, you can see number one is natural gas, although wind was number one in net additions per year already in 2008-2009. Um, <clears throat> and that nuclear is, is negative. Again, this is until uh, the end of 2010. So this is not including the shutdown of the German uh, reactors with another uh, eight and a half thousand uh, megawatts. So we have a situation where, where nuclear is actually sort of on the, on the, on the negative trend uh, together with, with um, oil and, and coal in the European Union. Um, on the contrary, those are, uh, this is the investment increase into uh, uh, renewable energy technologies worldwide. So standing now at, at getting close to 250 billion uh, US dollars. That's the, the kind of investment level uh, that uh, re renewable energy technologies attract with a, an annual growth rate of, of close to 30%. So even the economic crisis uh, has not had, did not have any significant uh, impact on that uh, uh, development. <clears throat> China alone invested in 2010 uh, approximately uh, 54.5 billion dollars, China alone. So China invested last year more than the entire world uh, in 2004. So you can imagine what kind of dynamic is, is, is in the sector, it's absolutely stunning. 
Now, just a few blips on a few countries uh, uh, the, in terms of the post-Fukushima reactions. First of all, of course, Japan. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think it's, it's highly underestimated on the international scale to what extent the Japanese public has been traumatized uh, by those events. It's very deep. I've been to Japan many times, uh, maybe 25 times. Um, and I've returned in September. Uh, and it's really uh, noticeable how profound people are shocked uh, about what, what uh, happened and the ongoing crisis, because it's, it's far from being, being over. The previous uh, Khan government has requested to shut down uh, three reactors south of Tokyo, Fukushima is in the north of Tokyo, uh, because it uh, is in a highly earthquake uh, uh, danger zone. Um, interestingly enough, uh, one of those reactors, was brand new, only started up in 2005. Um, uh, all new reactor projects have been uh, abandoned. Um, there is a reorganization that has been announced for the sector. Um, maybe the most uh, compelling fact is that currently there is only uh, 11 uh, reactors operating out of 54 uh, pre-Fukushima operational plants. 11 out of 54. Uh, the country has not, did not have uh, major uh, uh, blackouts. Um, it, it is interesting to see that basically the, the country was able to um, uh, have on the very short term uh, an incredible energy conservation effect. A lot of it of course by attitude and, and attitude change and, and an, the addition of many many different uh, activities. But uh, this is the, the load, what is called the load curve uh, for 2010 from uh, TEPCO, which is the Tokyo Electric Power Company. And uh, this is the, the curve for the first half of uh, uh, 2011. So it's remarkable to what extent uh, it not only they have succeeded in getting the peak down by close to 18%, but even in over time, uh, that, that lower consumption level has been uh, maintained. Remarkable. China was one of the first countries to, uh, uh, to react. Maybe one significant... I'm going to rush through this a bit uh, fast, so I'm not going to uh, go through every point. But I suppose this will be available probably after on the website, so that it, it would serve as a reference also um, after. Uh, one point which uh, has not been really reported as a dramatic impact in China is that um, China had a policy of deriving imported technology in, and, uh, into its own domestic technology. Um, and they have built up uh, a reactor that is called CPR-1000 that was to be built in a big series. Dozens of, of reactors were planned. And it's been decided to abandon uh, those, uh, that reactor technology beyond the reactors that are currently under construction. That's a dramatic decision because it basically means that they have to readjust all the nuclear planning to another um, uh, technology. But I've mentioned it before, uh, investment, I mean China doesn't only invest in nuclear power plants, it invests especially in renewable energy uh, technologies. And um, I said it's over 50 billion now in, in uh, renewable energy uh, in 2010, which is in the order of magnitude of five times what they're spending on nuclear power. Five times. They spend about twice as much on wind energy than they spend on nuclear. So <clears throat> the effect is already there pre-Fukushima. By the end of 2010, uh, uh, China had uh, uh, roughly uh, 40,000 megawatts of wind power uh, installed compared to about 10,000 megawatts of nuclear power. So that's where really major efforts go into. And as you can see in the, in the, uh, the blue is wind, the red is nuclear, 
uh, in the planning, uh, you still have a very major advance for, this is pre-Fukushima, for uh, wind energy, even if they had gone uh, you know, to su significant uh, increase in uh, nuclear power uh, technology. In the US, uh, the, the government remains committed to nuclear power. The problem is it's not the government that orders nuclear reactors in the US. Uh, it's utilities. And the utilities are basically uh, extremely reluctant to invest money into nuclear power. In fact, um, the South Texas project, which was one of the two most advanced new build projects, uh, the majority shareholder pulled out and dumped $480 million uh, investment into the project, which is significant. It's also for a larger utility a significant amount of money. Uh, so what, they, what do they do instead? Uh, you might have heard that in, in Germany, uh, electronics uh, giant Siemens has announced to entirely withdraw from nuclear power. Uh, a stunning decision considering that they have built all of the German nuclear power plants and that eight still remain uh, operational. Um, on the other hand, Siemens and, uh, in, has announced a strategic alliance with Boeing in August, last August, uh, announcing investment into smart grid uh, development for the US Army. And it's interesting to see, and I'm sure you will read about this in the coming years, the energy system becomes more and more like the internet. It's uh, a system that is based on small units that are connected on a horizontal, uh, in a horizontal logic, rather than a vertical logic where you rain kilowatt hours from centralized plants uh, onto uh, uh, consumers. Uh, France, uh, the government has remained committed to nuclear power, the public not, and we will have uh, another slide to this uh, later. Public uh, uh, opinion on one hand, and that drives political parties. The political party consensus that existed is broken after Fukushima. Uh, so the Socialist Party is one of the large political parties that is very likely to get into a government next year at the elections. Um, the leader, uh, the party leader, and number two are in favor of nuclear phase-out. Germany, you've heard probably enough. I Italy and Switzerland have been mentioned. 94% uh, in Italy uh, in favor of, um, I mean, against a restart of a nuclear program. And the Swiss have voted a prohibition of new construction on the 28th of uh, uh, September. Um, yeah, th actually, this is a public opinion survey uh, analysis that Arriva, the nuclear builder, has done in late March. And I really like the way they put it. Whereas polls have been done right after Fukushima event, international public opinion showed a certain resilience. A certain resilience. I mean, the terminology is quite remarkable. You know, when you see the kind of uh, shift in Switzerland, uh, uh, they lost 34% uh, in adherence to nuclear power. They lost 26% in Sweden, 24% uh, in Bulgaria, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In a major international 24-country study, uh, you can see that only uh, one country has actually a majority uh, that is in favor of uh, continuing to uh, to build nuclear power plants. That's Poland but I haven't been there yet. Um, <laughs> in, uh, if you let, ask the question, is nuclear power a viable long-term option? And uh, it's the, the favorable uh, positions are a very, uh, very uh, small number of uh, countries. Uh, and if you see, like even France uh, is down to 14%. Right? Nuclear France. Uh, people think, 14% think it's a viable long-term option. That's pretty remarkable in a country where three-quarters of the electricity are generated by nuclear power. Um, again, in France, two polls have been made which are amazing. 
Um, uh, one in March, same institute, same questions. Uh, one in March, one in June. And the overall uh, percentage of people that are in favor of nuclear phase-out actually increased between March and June from 70% to 77%. So you understand that the political parties start wondering whether they should stick to the old position on uh, nuclear power. So I'll conclude with this. Nuclear power plays a very limited role in the overall uh, energy picture. Uh, it's clear that uh, Nuclear power was on the decline before Fukushima, so it is a, um, a situation that, a trend that is being accelerated but not initiated through uh, Fukushima. It's very important to understand uh, this dynamic. Um, nuclear power um, is expensive, extremely expensive compared to other options, uh, and it will become more expensive um, after Fukushima. Public opinion remains extremely sceptical um, and renewable energy penetration is um, uh, accelerating. Now what I think is that the, the energy future is in decentralized, affordable, small-scale decentralized systems uh, that are highly efficient, basically the opposite of what is um, uh, represented by uh, nuclear power uh, technology. Um, and I think I will leave it with this, with a little statement to think about by your president. Thank you very much for your attention.